Hello, welcome to Saw is War. I am Dustin from Saturday Afternoon Wrestling, and it is a great day to talk about wrestling because this weekend is AW Revolution, one of their biggest shows of the year, and it is also the very last match for Sting, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, I think, bar none. Uh, no matter what company you were a fan of growing up, you probably felt some sort of way about Sting. Uh, but I'll get into all that. Uh, I got a couple things I want to hit first, a couple quick topics, things like that. And since this is the very first episode, episode zero, I don't know really what I'm going to call this yet, a practice episode, I'm, I'm not too sure. But before I get started in anything, just want to hit a couple housekeeping things. I just want to say, if anyone has found this, is watching this on YouTube, listening on wherever you get your podcasts, anything like that, cannot thank you enough. It is crazy to me that this channel uh, has been, you know, just under a year old now at this point. And to see, you know, the way it's grown, the the people that have been following it has been been more than I would have ever expected. So if you find this, thank you. Uh, if you enjoy what you're seeing, you can subscribe on YouTube. You can listen wherever you get your podcasts. And then also, more importantly, I don't know what this is going to be week to week. I don't really want it to just be me talking head every week for any set amount of time so also i'm going to drop an email address in the show description uh wherever youtube podcast form spotify apple wherever i'm gonna put an email there uh shoot any questions thoughts comments anything i missed for a week uh anything like that please send them over or you can just comment directly on youtube if you would like as well and i'll answer try to answer whatever i get as much as i can because <clears throat> because like I said, the, the community that is, that is built so quickly here faster than I would have expected is, has been the coolest part of all of this. And it would be weird to not try to, you know, incorporate that more and, and ask people, you know, for their thoughts. Cause one of the best things about being a wrestling fan is getting to talk with other people and getting to hear, you know, what other people like or what their theories are, what their fantasy booking might be for a thing. So please, if you find this, Please, if you find this, subscribe, follow along, hang out, and let me know all your thoughts. I appreciate it more than I can probably ever say. Now, that out of the way, I want to hit a couple things really quick before I get to AEW Revolution. Uh, predictions for that show, thoughts on it, stuff like that. It was a pretty busy week. I know we're, we're 40 days or so away, a little bit less than 40 days away from WrestleMania 40, which is shaping up to be a pretty good one. Uh, and a lot of things happened on the WWE side of things this week. There was this interesting interview that Seth Rollins and Becky Lynch did. It was like a like a Hot Ones themed interview where it was uh, Truth or or Eat a Hot Wing or Take a Bite. Uh, I don't remember. I think it might have been called. I don't think it was called Truth or Death. I can't remember what it was called. But one of the questions that Seth Rollins got was, "Say three nice things about CM Punk or Eat a Hot Wing," and he was like, "Yeah, I'm just gonna eat the wing." And I, I respect either he is so committed to the bit of hating CM Punk or he just hates him that much. But like, I feel like we're in a golden age of WWE haters right now between Seth Rollins, CM Punk, Drew McIntyre, CM Punk, uh, Logan Paul, Kev, Kevin Owens, all that. Like, it feels like there are just a ton of haters. Jimmy Uso, Jay Uso. Of like everyone is just hating on everyone and i can't remember a time where it was this like like comically committed <clears throat> if you have not seen that interview i think it's like 12 minutes on youtube please check that out it is it is pretty good it's always nice to see them interview together because obviously they're married they have a family now they have everything but like they just have such a fun chemistry together we also got big news out of uh rumored signings uh after missing out on so many different free agents there is a report that tama Tonga has finished up with new japan pro wrestling and is going to be heading to wwe and a lot of people think that he might be the person that they've been doing these um vignettes for which Someone else it might be. We will get to that in a, in a second here. But Tama Tonga is joining. Uh, WWE All Signs point to it. And a nice thing about that is they also just reintroduced uh, the club, Gallows and Anderson, to NXT. So it looks like if Tonga is going to NXT, we'll get that nice little bullet club. 
We'll get that nice little Bullet Club reunion first and then see what happens on the main roster. My guess would be something with Finn Balor after he splits from Judgment Day. Kind of seems to make the most sense, but but I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm just thinking here that that probably, if you bring in those guys, you have Gallows and Anderson on the roster, you bring in Tonga, uh, you, you probably want to put all of them with Finn Balor at some point, I would assume. Uh, but the other person that those vignettes might have been about uh, made his debut or his return, depending on how you want to look at it this week on NXT, the chairman, Sean Spears, formerly known as Ty Dillinger, the Perfect Ten. Uh, he returned with seemingly his AEW gimmick intact, and he blasted uh, Ridge Holland with a steel chair after a nice little vignette, uh, like voiceover thing. The, the arena got all dark, and he gave this this quick promo about you know, the truth will set you free, but it can hurt. And then he appeared from behind Ridge Holland and hit him with a chair. Kind of said the same thing in a weird, like, leaving the, leaving the building promo at the end of the show. Uh, and he seems to be back and in full swing here in NXT. No pun intended on that one. He seems to be back. Uh, and really, I think that's a good... I think that's a good depth signing like i don't know if he's gonna be the one to like dethrone Ilya dragunov or you know go on the main roster and have a huge run but like having someone there like that that can wrestle basically anyone on the roster and does just solid top to bottom work inside the ring character work everything promos like he i do think he is a, a great and very complete wrestler i think he got stuck with um kind of not a lot to do in aew it's going to be interesting to see if he can kind of break out of that or break at least like the stereotype or, or just like the, the tight cast of being the chairman. Like he's just the guy who hits people with chairs. So I'll be really interested to see what the character work looks like here because NXT has been a great spot for people to revitalize characters, refresh characters, change characters altogether. And I think just because he's coming from the outside in, I don't think that's going to be any different for him especially considering all of the success that he has already had in NXT. So I'm, I'm definitely super optimistic uh, based on just this first, uh, this first little bit that we got. On the AEW side of things, obviously the shows were building towards, uh, towards Revolution this weekend, but we did get a little bit of a tease uh, next week after Revolution. I think it's March 6th. Uh, the, the dynamite after revolution is being called big business and it is coming from Boston. And everyone believes that that is where Mercedes Monet is going to make her debut with AEW. And she made some news earlier this week ahead of that by basically saying and calling out uh, Julia, who has been rumored to be heading to WWE later this year with a tweet that basically said, stand on big business. If you want to have a match, Kind of like a, if you're leaving for WWE at, it, at this point, at some point, like, if you want this match, come get it. Uh, and that would be incredible. <laughs> that would be very, very cool. That would probably be an awesome match of the year level match. So let's hope everyone stays healthy. Let's hope she, let's hope Mercedes Monet debuts at Big Business this week. And let's get this match to happen so we can get one more great independent match before Julia goes to WWE and presumably sets that company on fire with how good she is as well. Then we had a pretty big SmackDown. I'm recording this Friday night after SmackDown. I was like, I know I want to post these on Saturdays, but I don't know if it's like, do I wait? Do I record early? Part of it, re record part of it. So I'm not too sure. We'll see what that's going to look like in the future. But for now, recording everything Friday night, uh, SmackDown ended. It was a crazy episode of SmackDown that feels like a lot got accomplished here. And obviously the biggest thing is going to be the developments with The Rock, Roman Reigns, and the Bloodline storyline, as well as Cody Rhodes and their side of the, the whole storyline and build. And before SmackDown, Friday afternoon, The Rock posted this video on Instagram and Twitter and all those places. It's like a 15-minute video where he just cut a promo talking down on everyone. He called out Cody, called out Cody's dog, Pharaoh. Don't really know why he did that. Like, like, like I said, a golden era of haters right now. Dude is even hating dogs to get that heat. You gotta respect it. 
he is he is back and he is committed. I, I guess that's what that means. Uh, he really, really buried Seth Rollins a couple times. And it was just all around. It was a really good, like, solid video. And, I mean, obviously it would be because The Rock is one of the best heel promos, I think, ever. And then, like, 30, maybe 30 minutes, maybe not even 30 minutes later, I looked again and the video was gone. And then I looked and it was back. And it was 22 minutes. Like He added seven minutes of hating to this video just so he could call him out more. And that was that was the big story before SmackDown hit. Then SmackDown starts, and we get this 40-minute bloodline segment with Roman Reigns and The Rock and Solo and Jimmy Uso, Paul Heyman, everybody, the whole deal. And The Rock is cutting this promo about how he doesn't want to do a one-on-one -on -one match with Cody Rhodes like Cody suggested. He wants a tag match, which has been pretty long rumored here at this point now. But he wants a tag match with all these stipulations where if Cody and Seth win, then the all of the bloodline will be banned from ringside for Cody's night two main event match with Roman Reigns. And if the Rock and Roman win, then it's going to be uh, bloodline rules, tribal rules again, um, which sign me up now because that has the makings of like just the schmaltziest like cheesiest jam-packed overbooked thing and it just sounds great it sounds like a great stuff like that's what i want i want big overbooked gigantic like after how good and straightforward last year's main event was they're obviously not going to just run the same thing back so the thought of a super overbooked main event on night two that has cody overcoming unbelievable odds non-stop uh, it's probably going to be pretty hard to ignore it kind of seems like that's where everything's pointing but they also went a very long way towards teasing dissension already between The Rock and Roman Reigns with Roman cutting him off and not letting him do the if you smell what The Rock is cooking, asking The Rock to acknowledge him, which he did. He said, I acknowledge Roman Reigns as my tribal chief uh, and, you know, did it in that Rock way where it's like, yeah, obviously he's not thrilled to be doing this. So there is already all sorts of tension building here. I'm sure it's going to blow up uh, night two. The only thing I really don't know <laughs> is if the rock screwing Roman over and hitting him with like a rock bottom or something is going to set up a SummerSlam match or if this is going to be like another full year build to next WrestleMania like John Cena and The Rock was. It's the only thing, really, because it, it kind of seems like other than that, all signs are pretty clear. Across the show, though, it wasn't just all Bloodline, even though it was about the first hour of programming. Rey Mysterio returned after an absence with injury, and he rejoined the LWO, and it looks like we're heading into an LWO uh, Legato del Fantasma, Elgato del Fantasma uh, matchup, which will probably be very good. That's that's a high work rate across the board. Like all of those guys are so talented. So I'm very happy to see that. I I really enjoyed uh, Santos Escobar and Carlito having a street fight. I enjoyed the subtle touch of Carlito wearing street clothes and not just doing a street fight in his wrestling gear. I think that's a nice touch. I don't know that that's just one of those little things. Uh, it's probably nitpicking, but you know, I don't, I don't really care. I, it's just, you know, you like what you like. And then probably the most like obvious saw it coming type of thing on the show really at this point, other than like the rock is probably going to turn on Roman Reigns. Uh, the other most like Dakota, Ta Dakota Kai and Bailey teamed to take on damage controls, tag team champions, the Kabuki warriors, Asuka and Kairi Sane, and wouldn't you know it, Dakota Kai uh, turned on Bailey and has aligned with Damage Control. I think anyone basically could see this coming. This is like the third time in her WWE tenure that Dakota Kai has turned on a teammate in a storyline. Uh, so it's truly going to be Bailey taking on all of Damage Control. And really, all I can say is, is those those baby face pops that she's going to get when she goes back to, like, the old music and the, the Bailey buddies and everything, that's going to be out of control. Because, I like, even now, fans just want to cheer for her. It, it's been, you know, over four years that she has been the, the role model heel character. So 
I think fans are more than ready for Bailey to go back to babyface, and it is clear that she is going to be about as babyface as it gets with all of the adversity that they're throwing at her. And last thing before I get into AEW Revolution predictions, thoughts, and all that, is I just wanted to take a minute and acknowledge Sting himself. Uh, like I said, this is going to be his retirement match. Probably have not missed that. If you follow wrestling in some capacity, you've probably heard it's his retirement match because it has been promoted as such for months. Since 2023, when he announced like at the end, of, I think it was October, November, he said, out oh, March is it. Like, let's go. Uh, and we've been building to this and, you know, before we get to that or, or after we get to that, if you're, if you're wanting sting matches, if you're, you know, kind of newer to wrestling or, or younger and didn't grow up watching sting in WCW or TNA, uh, where he really, he was the, the MVP of WCW. It is impossible to just describe what his impact was for that company. Uh, what he meant to that company, because something that that Sting did that is really I don't know how he did it, but like he was like John Cena levels of babyface for WCW, and he never got the backlash that Cena got or like the like super babyface Roman Reigns was getting, where it was like okay we're we're kind of tired of this. Like Sting could always switch up his character and. <clears throat> He could always switch up his character and he would he would keep the things that made him sting while twisting the character around, switching it up enough that it wasn't like it never got stale. It was always it was always exciting to see it. And it's funny watching old things, old matches back now. He It is so 90s, especially like Surfer Sting with the half face paint and the high the high flat top haircut and. He's ripped and like wearing like stringer tanks and stuff. Like it's crazy to to see that and think about crow sting and like Joker crow sting, uh, all the like permutations that he has done. And still, like the first thing that comes to mind for me is that that half face paint sting. Um, and and like I said, WCW he had wars with guys like Ric Flair, Diamond Dallas Page, Randy Savage. He he was just he was he was an icon. There's no better no better word to describe him. And the fact that he is still wrestling at this high a level, I think it's a testament to a few different things. I think it's a testament to him as a performer and how seriously he takes wrestling and he takes. The matches that he's going to have, he has been, you know, selective since he came back and debuted in AEW. Uh, he's been selective. He's only wrestled tag team matches, really. He's been with Darby Allen the whole time. Uh, he's not afraid to take gigantic risks. Like, he has done some crazy spots that, like, I wouldn't expect or ask of a, you know, of an, of an older man who came back from a, a legitimate career-ending neck injury. I wouldn't be like, hey, jump off of this high rise, like <laughs> down onto be like, there's just too much room for air. But but whether it's a passion for the business or a belief in himself or a desire to prove to himself that he could do all those things still, he has he's done it. He's been so enthusiastic about everything. And AEW on their end have treated him like such a big deal. They've been so reverential in what in the way they present him and how he has been booked. He is 28 and 0 on AEW on AEW programming. He has wrestled on all sorts of their shows. He's wrestled on Dynamites, Collisions. He is he is not just like Let's bring him out at special attractions. And I think that's what set this apart. Like he's been with AEW. I think it's like, I think this is coming up on the end of the third year. I think it was a three year deal and 28 matches in three years. Doesn't sound like a lot, but they have used it so well. And he has remained a fixture like alongside Darby Allen. And he has been there. Even if he's not wrestling, he's gotten involved. Even if he's not wrestling and they've just been really smart with how they've used him and that reverential treatment comes from the work that he did in those companies beforehand. He was unbelievably loyal to WCW. Who knows what would have happened if he jumped to WWE when they bought out WCW, but he never did. He didn't until, you know, 2014, 2015, when he crashed the Survivor Series. 
uh, which is also one of the best debuts I think uh, that I can remember. At least the the pop for him, the the reaction, the the commentary, everything about that debut is great. And it's a little it's disappointing watching that debut, knowing what's going to happen and how short his run in that company is going to be. But he's still in the WWE Hall of Fame because you can't tell a wrestling story really, or the, a story about the history of wrestling without Sting. TNA, like I said, same thing. Just a high rate of matches. In, tw- in 2006, TNA was running a Sting retirement angle. In 2006, like 18 years ago, they were running a retirement angle for Sting. And that's not to say, obviously, he did not wrestle the entire time since then. He had the forced retirement with medical issues. And like I said, he's been selective with his matches now in AEW. And they have been been careful in how they have booked him and presented him. Uh, but still, to think that 18 years later, he is going strong and is arguably like he's going to go out on his terms performing at at a high level maybe he's not quite exactly what we would have remembered watching in the you know in the 90s and in the 2000s but pretty damn close in terms of being able to just do clearly whatever he wants he's not limited in the moves that he can do like you can kind of see in a lot of those wrestlers as they age and continue you know trying to to perform and trying to keep that ability there Maybe it's, you know, partly because he didn't really have, like, a super high-flying move set all too much. Like, he would break things out, but it wasn't, like, the the basis of his wrestling. But I watch him now, and I'm blown away at how similar he still looks. So, all of this to say, if you're not sure why Sting has been made to seem like such a big deal... Uh, if you're not sure, you know, where to start with with anything, if you want to watch old Sting matches back, you can just type in Sting WCW on YouTube, or I think all the old WCW stuff is on Peacock with, uh, like, the WWE Network stuff. I believe it is all still there. Um, please, if you have not seen Sting outside of AEW, do yourself a favor and and just watch as much as you can. Because in the 90s, it is impossible to describe how cool Sting was and just what Sting meant to WCW in that WWF, WCW war. And in the Monday Night Wars, uh, he was he was like number one with a bullet for a lot of reasons. And you can tell. And it's crazy to think that the effect that he still has on audiences and on fans, there has never been a moment where it has felt like like nostalgia pops for him, like where it's like, oh well, it's Sting, so we got to be nice and be excited. It's like, no, this is this is Sting. Like we're all we're all pretty excited to see Sting here. Like I can't believe it's happening. Uh, so I am very excited for for Revolution for this last match. I have no idea uh, what's gonna happen. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but I'm very excited to see what happens. I'm happy that he gets to go out on his term. I'm happy too that it, it seems like he is as good a person as I would think, and as his reputation seems to seems to suggest that he is. Like everyone has had such nice things to say about him, which I think means a lot too. Darby Allen wrote a piece in the Players Tribune about Sting, like a tribute to him this week. That if you have not, if you have a time of the if you have a chance to read it. I highly suggest that you do because it is clear that that man loves Sting and that the two of them have built a very special relationship. And I'm not big on Darby Allen really, but I I really enjoyed that and I I thought it was a really touching tribute to him from someone who has been so closely associated with him through this whole AEW Sting run. All right, here we go. Brings me to my main point today. AEW Revolution coming at you from Greensboro, North Carolina, a very significant place because it is where Sting had his first match. So it is it is coming full circle here. He will be in the main event of the evening with Darby Allen to defend the AEW Tag Team Championship uh, against Matthew and Nicholas Jackson, the Young Bucks, who are on a great EVP heel run right now. But we'll get to that. I don't know why Wikipedia has the match card laid out the way it does, 
but it's got the pre-show match at the top and then it's got the card in order of main event down uh so i'm gonna start at the pre-show match and then just go down and work my way up i don't want to start with sting and, and darby allen uh, since that is confirmed to be the main event. So first off on the pre-show on Zero Hour, we have a tag match with Julia Hart and Sky Blue taking on Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander. And I've really enjoyed the storyline that they've been telling with Stokely Hathaway and him trying to ingratiate himself to Chris Statlander and Willow Nightingale. And I don't think that they would like go so far as to have one of them like one of those girls like turn on the other and one of them go heel. It, it kind of doesn't seem not possible because it's wrestling and anything's possible, but like doesn't seem like I don't understand what the point would be, I guess is, is more, more so my thought, but either way, this feels like it's probably going to be a face victory to, to end the pre-show on a, on a good note and to start the show on a high note as well, going into the main card. So I'm going to I'm going to say probably Chris Statlander and Willow get the win, but this was a a pretty late addition, I believe. I think I just saw it earlier today. I don't know if it was added tonight on Rampage. I haven't had the chance to watch Rampage yet, but I I don't remember seeing this before. So this must have been a pretty late addition. On the main card, we have got uh the first match listed or the the bottom match listed is an All-Star Scramble match. It is unfortunate and I hate to say it but Meat Madness has been canceled. I devastated along with, uh, I, I believe, probably anyone hearing this. It is terrible. Uh, Meat Madness had the makings of an instant classic. But earlier this week, Tony Khan uh, basically said, yeah, a lot of the people I wanted to use for this are hurt. It's like Keith Lee and Miro being the two that were specifically shouted out as being injured right now. Um so he's just going to hold off on it until everyone's healthy and everyone can participate. And, you know, probably for the better, but still. It was hyped, like, when it was announced, I was like, okay, I, I think I know, you know, the match I'm I'm ready to watch the most out of this card. Uh, but that's okay. <laughs> Waiting till everyone is healthy is probably going to be better in the long run anyways. Uh, it'll just give more, it'll make it more of a spectacle, and with something called Meat Madness... <laughs> I'm sure the more spectacle, the better. So in its place, we've got an all-star scramble match with Chris Jericho, Wardlow, Powerhouse Hobbs, Lance Archer, Hook, Brian Cage, Magnus, and Dante Martin. And the winner receives an AEW world title match. And that stipulation is a little restrictive because only a few names here that I could see conceivably viably having a world title match. So right out of the gate, it it really it highlights Chris Jericho, Wardlow, and Hook to me. I don't know that they would go with Chris Jericho here. Who knows? Because they've kind of seemed to just be rolling with him despite everything going on uh, with the reaction he's been getting from live crowds and everything about about. And everything going on uh, related to him. So who knows? But it, it wouldn't surprise me. I guess Tony Khan loves him some Chris Jericho. And he's a good steady hand to have in any world title match. Instantly elevates any match uh, as far as like name recognition and, and marketability. So it wouldn't surprise me. I think I'm probably leaning Wardlow here. I think I'm probably leaning Wardlow here because of the reaction he's gotten the last couple weeks. In particular, after the the promo that he cut, um, that was that was just awesome. But I think it was two weeks ago on Dynamite. After that, it is it has been renewed interest in Wardlow, and I think they need to start doing something with the Undisputed Kingdom to like make them look more viable and like an actual threat. I'll get to that as well a little bit later with uh, the Roderick Strong the Roderick Strong match, but. I really think that they need to to start, you know, making these guys look like a like a competent real threat. And I think Wardlow is one of those nice people that you can you can book into a title match because he can wrestle, you know, heel versus heel or he can wrestle a face depending on, you know, what happens in the championship match. So I I think this is probably going to be a Wardlow win and I think throwing in names like Hook and Chris Jericho is there to give even more credibility to it 
rather than like Wardlow beats all of the other guys. Also, too though, Powerhouse Hobbs would be cool. I I wouldn't be mad at at Hook or Hobbs winning. I just I'm gonna say Wardlow. I think next up on the list we've got FTR versus the Blackpool Combat Club, John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli. Uh, this feels like an FTR win. Those are North Carolina guys. Uh, this is like a hometown match for them. So I don't really see. I think it's gonna be a good hard hitting match. I think the the previews we've gotten in the last couple of weeks with the matches they've had have have kind of hinted, you know, a pretty strong chemistry and a good like hard hitting match because that's kind of what these four guys are are all about. Like they're probably hyped to get out there and like beat the shit out of each other. If I had to guess, so. I think it'll be good. I think it's going to be uh, one of those like hard hitting, like maybe a slower pace to start and then kind of pick it up. But I'll be interested to see where this is on the card because I think it's, it's, you know, four people that the crowd is going to be really hot for, but the match may not necessarily have like all of the action that like matches the intensity that the crowd has to start, if that makes sense. So I'm going to say FTR, pull this one out. Uh, then we have the TNT Championship match with Christian Cage defending against Daniel Garcia. This, again, feels kind of straightforward. Like, this feels like a Christian Cage win because that dude is doing, like, the best work of his career right now. He has been incredible uh, so far on this run and this reign with uh, Killswitch, uh, Nick Wayne, and Nick Wayne's mom. <laughs> as his stable just going around insulting people's dead parents it, it's unbelievable the the heel work that he is doing i think daniel garcia is great i think he is probably a future champion i might be a champion this year and he's probably going to hold this belt uh before too long but i just i don't think it's going to happen this weekend Next, we got the women's title match it is timeless tony storm defending against diana perrazzo and I feel really bad for Deanna Perrazzo because she's she's an incredible wrestler and they're going to have a great match. These two have known each other and have wrestled each other for decades. It's been the build of the story how long they have known each other. Uh, but all signs pointing to Mercedes Monet joining the company, you know, like next week, like as soon as next week, the money match is Mer Mercedes Monet and Tony Storm. Uh, that that's kind of just it it's what makes the most sense i don't know how they would pivot from it this close to it possibly happening so i think i think it's a bad spot as far as timing goes for diana perrazzo because she's absolutely women's world champion material and i'm sure she's gonna hold that title at some point because she's pretty much too good not to but the timing of it all just kind of really throws things off. So I think this is going to be a Timeless Tony Storm win and a title defense. And we roll right in towards a Tony Storm Mercedes Monet showdown. Then we got the triple threat match for the AEW world title. It is Samoa Joe defending against Swerve Strickland and Hangman Adam Page. <sighs> I don't know about this one. I This is a match that I am I'm really excited for. But at the same time, like, it kind of feels like they're overbooking it and overcomplicating it for no real reason. Maybe the, the reason is just to make Adam Page, like, to fully cement the heel turn that he's on right now and this descent into becoming just a coward that he's on right now. But I don't understand the whole we're going to run an angle where it looks like he really hurt his ankle and he shoes away the cameras and he gets help to the back and then the report comes out that he's fine and he's just really good at selling and then this week dynamite starts with him coming out on a crutch and then swerve comes out and then samoa joe comes out and then surprise hangman's fine and he hits swerve with the crutch like i don't that just feels like a long way to go about hangman hitting swerve could have done it with a chair, could have hit him, you know, weeks ago, last week, could have, you know, it didn't have to be a trap. Like, I don't know if that's just to show that he's an underhanded, you know, villain now, or if it's just they thought there was going to be extra heat to gain with the injury angle. I'm not too sure. I do know that the, the rapid descent that they have done with Hangman has kind of got me rethinking this match. Because before, I was looking at this, and I was like, okay, I don't know who's winning, but I know Hangman Adam Page is getting pinned. 
Like, I know he is absolutely eating the pin here. And now, I'm not so sure. I, I really, I feel weird saying that, but I'm not so sure. I think there is a world where any one of these three guys could win the title. I think Samoa Joe makes sense retaining it because he brings a lot of credibility to the belt. And he's a credible champion that can really versatile. He's really versatile and he can fit those different matchups. Like if it's a face matchup, if it's a heel versus heel, like I said, with like Wardlow, like Samoa Joe can slide into that and maintain credibility in basically any type of story. He's getting unbelievable crowd reactions right now, basically telling him he's going to, he doesn't care who's there. He's going to just whoop all their asses and choke out whoever's there. Cause that's what he does. And it just sounds awesome. <laughs> like when he gets on a roll and starts cutting those promos, it just sounds cool. Like, there's no way around it, no matter what bad stuff he does. And you could say the same thing about Swerve Strickland. Swerve is, like, the hottest dude in the company right now. It's it's awesome to see. It's awesome to see the reactions he's getting. Did unbelievably terrible stuff the second half of 2023, and he's still, like, the breakout top star of this year so far. And, you know, it, he's not quite fully babyface yet, but he's pretty damn close in crowd reactions. So it doesn't surprise me at all that he's right here at this point because he's so talented. He's so over. It's it's a matter of time on when he's going to get this belt. But the more and more I think about it, I don't know I don't know what purpose Samoa Joe is going to serve after this match when the money story is Hangman and Swerve. And AEW, if there's one thing I know about them and their title reigns, they love booking a champion that like wants to make the the baby face jump through hoops to get to them. Oh, you got to beat X, Y, Z. Oh, you got to, you know, do this. You got to, you think about, it wasn't for the title, but you think about like MJF and Cody Rhodes and MJF's like, you got to take 10 lashes if you want a match with me. Like stuff like that is like very tried and true in the AEW world. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if, Hangman Adam Page steals this title, steals the match somehow from one of those guys, and then immediately comes out on Wednesday and cuts a promo that's like, I'm the champion, swerve, go see ya buddy, you're never getting this match against me, uh-uh, not in your life, and then there we go, we embark on the, the few month story of swerve, completely cementing himself as a baby face, and building himself back up to earn that match, and finally getting the one-on-one -on -one shot, and Hangman Adam Page just goes more and more crazy and desperate as he realizes time is running out because he's never beat Swerve one on one, and I I just feels like that's like that feels like the tried and true AEW formula, and I would probably be leaning Samoa Joe like ninety nine percent of the time otherwise, but the fact that it's these two guys. The fact that it's Swerve and Hangman Adam Page that are the two in this match. It makes the most sense to me because those are two dudes that are the future of the company. Like those are our champions that are going to carry this company for years to come. If AEW is going to, you know, stay as successful and continue to grow. Those are two guys that are going to be unbelievably important to it. And so building a storyline around the title, around the two of them, while both are hot and doing like some of the best work of their careers, it's just, it's too advantageous to not take advantage of. So I don't think Samoa Joe is going to just get lost in the shuffle. He can come out and cut a promo the next night and probably get himself right back into credibly challenging for the title. Uh, but I, I, you know... I feel like, like I said, anyone can win this, but I'm going to say Hangman Adam Page steals it and we embark on the full babyface swerve coronation. A lot less involved, but next we've got the AEW International title, Orange Cassidy defending against Roderick Strong. And this is a match, like I said earlier, with Wardlow. This feels like Roderick Strong has to win because dethroning Orange Cassidy, who is such a popular babyface and such a workhorse for the company. Dethroning him instantly gives Roderick Strong credibility. Roddy's the type of workhorse wrestler that can, that can hold a title like that and put on great matches weekly. 
Uh, and it also makes the group, the Undisputed Kingdom, that much more viable, that much more of a threat. Who knows how much longer Adam Cole is going to be hurt. But those guys need to start looking like more than just beating people down and winning matches like underhandedly. Like They need to start establishing themselves as a credible, viable group that can be a top heel group in the company. Because right now, it doesn't feel like they're close enough to main event status which is crazy to say with all of the people involved so i think this is maybe it's an underhanded you know they cheat to win but i think roderick strong kind of has to win here uh just for the sake of advancing this group and then last we got the main event of the night at the main event of the night we've got sting and darby allen the world tag team championship defending against the young bucks matthew and nicholas jackson uh, this has been an incredible heel run for the Young Bucks since they came back and have been doing these EVP characters, talking about finding people and, and picking fights with people and throwing their power around. Incredible, incredible leaning into uh, the real life reputations and, and like ne negative things people have been saying. Like it, It's an incredible use of that into their characters. I've really enjoyed this little uh month or so run that they've been on um a lot more than i would have expected to be completely honest but i am so torn about what is going to happen with this match because this feels like legitimately they might decide it like as they're walking out the curtain there's so many things that go into this match like, you have Sting, who is the ultimate wrestling purist and historian, who knows I need to lose and put over the Young Bucks on the way out, because that's what you do in this business, is you go out on your back. You've got, he's holding a title for the first time in AEW with Darby Allen. <clears throat> Dropping him to the Young Bucks makes sense, because it's clean, the Young Bucks have been in this heel role, they've been doing great. And, you know, you, you pass the title off to them, the tag titles off to them, and then you're off and running with whatever the next story for them is going to be. So I see it. I can understand dropping the title uh, to them. I, it would be a, a clear, safe decision. But on the other side of things, Tony Khan is probably the biggest Sting fan on the planet, if I had to guess. Like, that dude loves him some Sting. So I could see him wanting to talk Sting into retiring on top, going out on top. Then you get a nice opportunity to do something with the tag titles, like have Darby relinquish them and say, I'm not tagging with anyone that's not Sting. And we get an AEW tournament. We get a tag team turmoil tournament. We get a tag team continental classic, whatever you want to call it. But the AEW tag team division is sneaky, really stacked. They've got so many good teams and a couple great teams in Ring of Honor as well that they could pull over. And they could really do something cool uh, if they went that tournament type of route and then reset the field and set the Young Bucks off on, you know, a feud with people that are going to be there every week and that they can they can pivot right into that type of feud with. And you still get the the benefit of staying going out on top surrounded by family and loved ones i can picture the black and white confetti raining down whatever they do maybe the visual of him holding both tag titles like holding them both up and celebrating at the end of the show hugging everybody and everything like that feels like too good of a feel-good moment to to pass up uh, I understand that all of this, no matter how good it sounds, could be, you know, just vetoed if Sting just decides the day of, like, no, I should lose. So there's definitely a chance of that, but I think I'm going to say Darby and Sting retain. I think Sting is going to get that moment to go out on top. I think he has had a couple false finishes to his career, medical retirement and things that, that weren't fair and that weren't on his terms. So I think going out on his terms in a feel good moment, I think it's okay to, to buck convention and, and the, the history of it a little bit and they don't have to lose. And the other thing I think really before, before I wrap up here is sting hasn't lost in AEW. He's 28 and 0, and it doesn't make sense. Like, 
The Young Bucks are doing great heel work right now. And the heel heat they would get from ending Sting's undefeated streak, ruining his retirement match, and winning the titles obviously would be huge. Do the Young Bucks need it? Like, do they, are they going to be, like, super, like, that, that much bigger of heels if they win? So, if this was, like, another younger team or, or a less established team, I could see it a little bit easier. But I think because it is a team like the Bucks, who can lose and then come back Wednesday and instantly be right back in the title scene just because that's kind of what their characters are right now, but also just because that's they're that established. So I really think that that kind of is what, what pushes me over the top to, to say that I think it's going to be a Sting, Darby Allen win and a really feel-good moment to end his career and to bring the night to an end. But that's one where, like I said, you could tell me anything and I will, I will believe it. I cannot wait to see what that match is going to look like look like from a booking standpoint and just what crazy stuff Sting is going to have planned for it, knowing it is his last match. I can only imagine that he is going to go absolutely nuts. So there we go, guys. That is everything. That is AEW Revolution. That is a wrap on the first episode of Saw is War. If you missed the first part or anything like I said, you can always leave a comment, any thoughts, questions, opinions, anything like that, predictions for the show this weekend, or you can shoot an email. I'll put the email address in the description and in the show notes. It'll be right there for you. Please love to hear from anybody if you have any thoughts uh, on wrestling. It could be AEW, WWE. It could be any outside companies as well. I don't follow those as closely, but I'm always happy to check new things out. If there's something I missed or something that is too good to miss, please shout it out and let me know. Uh, like I said, I really appreciate anybody that has found this channel or anything uh, that I've posted, videos, shorts, anything like that. If you have found it and watched it and enjoyed it, really cannot thank you enough and, and cannot give enough appreciation. So thank you for hanging out. We'll be back soon. Uh, in the meantime, though, enjoy Revolution this weekend. And thank you, Sting.